This is a maitake, and today I'm gonna to be showing you guys how to forage this mushroom. Let's go. What's up guys, welcome back to Gleese on Life. If you're new here, I'm Alex Gleese and today I'm gonna to be showing you guys how you can find and forage maitake and then later I'm also gonna be showing you how I like to cook it up. So let's get right into it and I can show you guys exactly how you can find this mushroom, locate it and identify it. Today I'm joined by Katie, my yeah! fiance, <laughs> and Will, my roommate from college. So they're new to foraging maitake you've never done it right i have maybe once. once will has never really foraged mushrooms before so it should be pretty fun to get to show them around they're going to be learning right alongside you guys so let's get into the first tip on how to find maitake so the first thing you want to do when you're looking for maitake is identify the trees i know that tree identification can be a little bit difficult and i'm not claiming to know all the trees in the forest but I do know when you're looking for maitake, you need to look out for big oak trees. You wanna look for these really, really big old oak trees. It's like, like you and can't you can even fit your arms Katie all the way around it. Katie can't even fit her Half arms way. around it, it's that big. <laughs> so this mushroom is gonna be found, especially on old oak trees, big yeah. old oak trees and dying yeah. oak trees. So this mushroom actually feeds on the decaying roots of the oak tree so you're always going to find it at the base of the tree and it's a surefire way to really find this mushroom this is how you identify the tree you get a friend and then if your if your arms can connect around it then it's for certain an oak tree okay perfect so you're going to find this mushroom in the fall and unfortunately if you live on the west coast you're not going to be able to find this mushroom it doesn't grow on the west coast so if you're watching from the West Coast, hopefully you guys can live vicariously through us finding this mushroom. But if you live on the East Coast, you better get out there in the fall and find this mushroom because it will feed you for weeks. That's how much you can find at a time. The most surefire way to find an oak tree if you don't know what it looks like is to look for acorns. So you can see right here on the ground, lots of acorns. And then we also have oak leaves. So oak leaves are pretty distinct. This is a different type of oak. Uh, each different type of oak will look a little bit different. This one is more pointy. These leaves here are a little bit more lobed. Those are oak leaves as well. So that's a really good way to look for these trees if you don't know what the trees exactly look like. We're gonna go ahead and pick this big one that we found. Um, basically to pick it mm -hmm. for these ones when they're this big. I would normally cut the mushroom, but with these ones, it's difficult to kind of like see under there. So we're just gonna pick it. I'm gonna do this one first, just to show you how it's done. And then you can do the next one. And it's pretty simple. There's not, there's not really much to it. So we're just gonna kind of like gently excavate it from under here. So see that one part is not coming with it, but that's okay. It might be a separate mushroom actually. Whoa. So yeah, really, if you're careful pulling it, you shouldn't harm the mycelium down in the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, some people <laughs> claim that you need to cut it. If there's no real evidence showing that you need to, but I try to when I can with these, I, I don't really, but you do want to be careful. Like you see, there's a lot of dirt, so we don't want to flip it all the way over because then we're going to get dirt all inside yeah. of this and make our life a lot harder. So we can start to kind of clean it up and uh, get rid of some of this and start to cut it away. Some of this dirt. We also have to be careful. We don't want to dull our knife too much on the dirt. You're going to want to try and keep all of it, right? You're going to feel bad. You're going to be like, wasting. Oh, I'm wasting, but really you're not. Yeah, just cut away at least the worst of it. And then you can do more detailed work at home. Now, these these mushrooms too will have a lot of insects in them. The, the insects like to hide out in these. So you'll see that when we bring it home, 
we're gonna start to pull this thing apart and there's gonna be all sorts of little bugs hiding out in this thing. Mario so, saw a lot of mosquitoes, that's why I have this on. Yeah, we we wanna try and leave them in the woods if we can, but yeah. when we get home we'll we'll put them outside. So will this regrow into more mushrooms? Does it have like the cultural um, spores or whatever? It can spread it. Uh, I tend to just like leave this where it was. Yeah. But the mycelium shouldn't be harmed from us plucking it as long as we don't go like yeah. digging into the ground. So, nice. yeah. This um, is it? This is it. So what about this brown spot? We'll get that when we, when we, we go home. Okay. So yeah, this one is pretty good. It's hefty. Yeah, you can hold it. I don't know, that one's probably like 8 pounds, 7 pounds? Yeah, it's a mushroom head, literally. It's it might even be bigger than that, it might be closer to 10. Yeah. Is it really that heavy? Yeah. Wow. They can get up to, geez, I don't know, I've seen people at least 20 pounds, sometimes I've, I think I've seen some that are close to like 30 or 40. They get huge. Jeez. So, yeah, it's a beautiful mushroom. Just really, my taki. really my tasty taki, too. Yeah. Just make sure it's not dried out, not spored out before you pick it. But other than that, it's pretty easy. How could you tell if it was spored out? Spored out, so you can kind of see here on this that it's kind of white. That's the spores. So when it's spored out, it'll start to drop the spores. So this one's starting a little bit, but it's not too bad. Also, another thing, I said that I was going to teach you guys how to identify this. We didn't really go into detail on that yet. So, it's very easy to identify. One, it grows at the base of oak trees. That's already a huge identifier. Two, it grows in fall. Already another huge identifier. Now, you can't really mistake this for anything toxic, but you can mistake it for some other things that look similar, that are still edible, but need to be handled a little bit differently. So you can mistake this for the Berkeley's polypore, I'll pop the scientific name of that one on screen. We found that in one of my last videos. Um, that one's edible, needs some work to, to use it. You can also mistake this one for, and I see this all the time in the summer, mistake it for the black staining polypore, Meripolis sumstinii. So that happens a lot. The main way to tell the difference is the fronds on the maitake, uh, Grifola frondosa, also sometimes called hen of the woods, are smaller than they are on the black staining polypore. And also with the name black staining, if you were to take the black staining polypore and damage it and break it, it would start to stain black. First it turns brown, then it turns black. So that's the obvious sign that if this doesn't stain black, you have hen of the woods. All right, so we picked the one here, which was a, about a foot or two away from the tree, but you can see there's out actually a few more growing right at the base of the tree and that's typically how you'll find them growing and on a big oak tree like this when you see one you want to make sure that you walk around and check all the way around the tree because here's one more and if you didn't come all the way around you would have completely missed this really nice one on the back side and then the very last thing is once you found them and one tree, they will likely be back the next year. So now that you have a spot, you can come back year after year and harvest maitake each and every fall. Grab it like down, all the way down. Mm -hmm. You'll feel where it's kind of stuck mm -hmm. and then just kind of tip it one way. Yep, there you go, now it's loose. And then you can put it on its side, kind of like I did, not turning it all the way upside down and start to kind of I would recommend brushing it first, see what comes loose, and then you can see where you really need to cut. And also pull like leaves off and stuff like that. So this one's really nice as well. I feel like I'm breaking it as I'm holding it. Piece of it's okay to break it a little bit. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> like you can see like some of the dirt and stuff and sometimes this will grow through like tree branches even so like sometimes you really have to clean it up usually they're pretty dirty that's that's pretty good for now though okay. just get the worst of it off nice nice Thanks. Can you 
It's a beauty. This one's pretty clean because of where I cut it, I think. All right, so now that we've picked a few of these, I think we picked three in total. We're gonna leave the rest of them on the tree because it's just more than what we need. So we're gonna take these home, clean them up, and then we're gonna get to cooking them. So we'll see you guys when we're back at home. What we're gonna do today is use the bigger of the mushrooms that we harvested and make mushroom jerky. I just wanted to show you guys first what this thing kind of looks like on the inside. Um, just cause if you never forged this before, I'm sure that you're curious to see what it actually looks like. And then I'm also gonna just quickly go over how I'm gonna clean it. Usually these are quite dirty on the inside, but I think that we're pretty lucky and I think the ones we grabbed are relatively clean. Let's go ahead and crack it open and then take a look at it. So here's a good close look of the underside. You can see that the Hen of the Woods has this almost branch-like structure to it. You can see there, there are bugs in it as well, just like I said out there. That's why you really have to crack this thing open. I'm gonna split it in half. Look at that. So you can see the pores are white and you can really see that branch like structure of it now. And that's why you have to crack it open is because the dirt will be all in between those little branches. Luckily, since we're making jerky, it's okay to get it a little bit wet first because the first thing we're gonna have to do is boil it or simmer it. I'm gonna clean most of this up with a brush and a knife and then I'm gonna get kind of that last little bit that you can't really get off just by rinsing it a little bit. How's it going? VoiceOver Alex here, gonna walk you through how I like to make mushroom jerky. First, grab the biggest stock pot that you can possibly find, cause you'll have way more mushroom than you know what to do with. Load the mushroom in and fill the pot with water until the mushrooms are just covered. Crank the temperature up on your stove top as high as it can possibly go and start bringing your water to a boil. Once boiling, reduce the heat until you have a steady simmer and allow the mushrooms to simmer until the stock has reduced significantly. Remove the mushrooms and lay them out to cool. And make sure you burn your hands when you're taking them out. This is a necessary step. Make sure you don't throw out the leftover broth concentrate as this is a great addition to soups and other meals. Once your mushrooms have cooled, you can start to marinate them. I chose to use garlic, ginger, cinnamon, star anise, enough soy sauce to supply you with your weekly sodium intake, a little bit of mirin, and a dash of sesame oil. Mix it around and cover it before you place it in the fridge to marinate overnight. You could also choose to use a Ziploc bag here, but I didn't have any on hand, so a bowl it is. After marinating overnight, I added a good amount of goji garu. Adjust this part to your own desired spice level. I like mine spicy. Now all that's left is to load your dehydrator trays. Fill your dehydrator, close the door, and it'll magically be done. Now wouldn't that be nice? I like to set my dehydrator anywhere between 120 and 130 degrees Fahrenheit and dehydrate until the mushrooms are still slightly pliable. And there you have it. Beautiful, delicious umami mushroom jerky ready to be gobbled down. Now, time for the taste test. Should I eat it? Yeah, give it a taste. Oh. This is my ration for today. Mmm. <laughs> is it good? Yeah. I'm not like a big the biggest fan of beef jerky because it's pretty I feel like it's pretty oily. Like it feels very unhealthy when you're eating it. And you got the nice flavor from the mushroom jerky, but you don't get all that oiliness. So, big fan. 10 out of 10. You gonna try some? Alright, now it's my turn to give it a taste. Looks pretty good. I will say that much. So. Mmm. 
a little tough, but overall, it's good. It's a little spicy, a little salty, a little bit of a umami from the mushroom. So, overall, overall, way, way better good. than beef jerky. So, if you have a lot of mushroom, which you will after watching my video and going out and finding your own end of the woods, you're gonna have a lot of extra mushroom. So this is a great way to use up that mushroom, kind of preserve it, and you also get a great, beautiful umami packed broth, which you can also use for other recipes. Hopefully you guys enjoyed watching today's video and learning how to make mushroom jerky and forage my taki. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Let us know what you thought down below, and we'll catch you guys in the next one. Don't see that at home on your couch, huh? <laughs> That's what we're doing.